uh, I think you, all of you are aware that these sessions are re being recorded and then they will be uploaded on YouTube. So yeah, let's start with today's session. And thank you for joining everyone. And so, so what 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 are some of the things that we are going to discuss today is we will be discussing. We'll start with you know the weekly assignment solution. We'll discuss the results. And if you have you know clarifications, ask with respect to this assignment. Do ask me there itself so that I can help you understand why something is the way it was. And uh, since this week was mostly on trying to understand climate change, and I felt like uh, the lecture was from the previous assessment of IPCC, which was in 2014, and the recent assessment was released in this year, 2023. So I thought I, I can help with some of those statistics that are brushed up, that have been you know updated. So I will be touching about a little bit about those report, the latest report, and then carbon capture and storage technologies, and basically how it is done. The Ed brief overview about that. Okay, so yeah, let's start. So, and yeah, if you have any doubts, you can unmute yourself and ask, or raise your hand, or you can drop that question in the chat box. So. Which of the following best describe the relation between energy demand and the GDP growth? So either whether it is energy demand and GDP growth are completely unrelated, energy demand decreases as GDP grows, energy demand and GDP growth have a positive correlation, energy demand increases initially but levels of as GDP growth. So they basically there are multiple scenarios here where which describes the best relationships. So you know, let's say scenario. Uh someone raised the hand. Uh, do you have something? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So basically uh, what they were asking is what's the relationship between GDP and energy demand. So GDP will be something like this. So what will happen if GDP increases? What will be the energy demand? You know, per capita. It can per capita or it can be gross also overall. So whether it's going to increase, which is what the positive correlation says, this just unrelated. It can be straight this way or this way, or it decreases or it increases initially and then it levels off. The multiple possibilities is like that, that can happen with energy demand and GDP. So uh, when we, we have, so how do we do this is basically we have real world data of different countries where you know, you know of GDPs, what's the GDP and what's the energy demand. So when you plot with real data, what you get is, you know, energy demand increases as the GDP growth GDP of the country grows. So it has a positive relation and you know shows this type this type of relationship. So this is what a positive correlation is. As one factor increases, the other also increases. Here GDP increases, the energy also, energy consumption also increases. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that is going on. Modernization of industries has led to a decrease in energy demand in the industry sector. Okay, because you know most of either we have upgraded our technologies or we have made our technology or machines much more efficient. So what happened was uh, there was a decrease in the energy usage by most of you know most of the sectors. So which of the following industries comply with the above state? So which sector has shown this decrease? Paper and pulp production consumer electronics, industrial automation, indoor agriculture and vertical form. So let's take one by one. So let's start from the bottom. So indoor agriculture and vertical farming. So for this, uh, if you remember, if you have heard about indoor agriculture and vertical farming, uh, this happens. This 
this happens especially uh you know uh in in places where you you want to control a lot of other factors like indo agriculture you, you don't have electricity also so you need energy for getting the light for the for the agriculture so there is an extra energy demand that is being uh needed when compared to normal agriculture and industrial automation where you know all of the processes are automated by machines so so for machines to operate you need energy uh hi someone is raising hand person do you have something no sure yeah and then consumer electronics so the electronic gadgets that we are buy earlier at most there used to be you know one mobile in a household now at least you have one mobile per individual or two mobiles per individual in a household so as the consumer electronics are increasing so is the industry and the industrial energy demand and coming to paper and pulp so paper and pulp is you know most of us have been shifting from you know uh written based to you know electronic based even the classes or the way we write exams are mostly you know electronic so in that aspects uh or the way we, we produce our paper and pulp well, have become efficient much more efficient so in both these aspects paper and pulp industry has you know reduced in terms of the energy demand so yeah so that's that uh, paper and pulp industry and going ahead as per the installed power generation capacity report given by indian ministry of power the contribution by solar power is what is the contribution so so it's very less uh that that's what solar power is contributing very less to the overall power that is in, you know generated in the subcontinent so yeah it's very low so going on so there will be a continued prevalence of internal combustion engines for the next 30 years so internal combustion engines are basically uh the engines of what all the motor vehicles that we see these days they are all internal combustion where combustion happens in, in within the engine and that releases energy and that that energy is used for you know movement of the vehicle so this statement is saying that this will prevail for the next 30 years so which of the following is not a factor contributing to the above statement so age factor because you know because of the age or is it that like having internal combustion vehicle engines is you know more convenient for us ease of fueling and operation it's is easy to access fuel and then operate in those vehicle those type of vehicles and decrease pollutant emission so you see internal combustion engines even for the next 30 years it's not the reason that we are seeing you know a decrease in pollution emission because uh this come when the combustion happens there there is always you know uh emission of pollutant that happens so it has to be the reason that that doesn't contribute why you see it. so the ma major reason that you see is because you know they they are really old technologies or either we have you know fuel we we know we we are this few fuels that we use are not long lasting so going ahead uh, energy consumption per unit of gdp is called so it's called energy intensity similarly uh, there are not enough number of fossil fuel and oil reserves that can handle our energy demands for the next century whether this statement is true or false 
so saying that we have enough fossil fuels or not so we have enough fossil fuel for the next century but the problem is if we keep on emitting or utilize these fossil fuels in the next century they are not you know long lasting enough but they will last for us for the next century and they will cause you know all these effects of climate change global warming all these effects they, they bring with them and yeah coming to these gases so lifetime of no and no2 is dash with respect to n2 whether it is less than or equal than greater than or cannot be estimated basically how long if a molecule of no is released into the atmosphere will it stay as such in the atmosphere without reacting you know with other components so the life cycle of no and no2 are relatively less than n2o because you know n2o is relatively more stable in in its molecular configuration compared to no and no2 which are highly rare uh and coming to global warming potential how is it calculated so global warming potential is basically a number that describes uh how much warming each each of the gas can or any compound can provide so it is calculated related to carbon dioxide because it's what we generally measure in general which we have been measuring for the past centuries when you try to correlate with you know how climate change has been going on since we attribute it mostly to carbon dioxide so we measure it with respect to carbon dioxide so the value the global warming potential of carbon dioxide is one so all other gases will have you know higher values or lower values or equal to carbon dioxide so yeah and mercury is taken up taken up by aquatic or microorganisms as you know elemental mercury or mercury chloride mercury iodide or methyl mercury so methyl mercury is the form in which uh, most of the aquatic microorganisms tend to uptake mercury as ch3hg it is the chemical formula okay and a lot of people might have heard about this case especially so yeah the lowing of a monument near a coal power plant is caused by which of the following gases so as we all know that coal power plant when it burns it releases multiple lot of gases and all of most of the gases are represented here but which of these gases leads to a lowing of monument uh for instance think about you know taj mahal which is you know white when it was constructed it was white but now it's gradually changing its color because of these gases so the phenomena associated with this is you know uh, if you are, if you have thought of it is mostly the acid rains so which which all of these gases can form acids you know the stronger acids that can react with the monument are especially nit nitric acid sulfur sulfuric acid and similar nitric acid so no gases and then sulfur dioxide so this is a multiple answer question so a yeah, b c d were the answers so yeah that's all with the you know previous assignment questions hope uh, yeah if you have anything just uh, ask me here so that you know i can uh, take it take any of your doubts and then help you clarify in case if no one has any doubts i can i will move on so you know we are like trying to see what what is the latest the assessment of ipcc has brought to us okay uh looks like no one is having any question regarding this assignment so let's go ahead so yeah this 2023 report came out in march of this year so yeah 
let's talk about a little bit about the greenhouse gases and then how global warming and climate change how do we know that the climate is changing or global warming is taking place so if you if you look at this infographic which are majorly sourced from this recent report and for which the link is given below each slide so if you look here uh, so this graph starts somewhere between from 1850s to current with this is showing greenhouse gas emissions okay especially carbon dioxide and then non carbon dioxide emissions so how how it has increased across years if you look at here it was you know very very few or very minimal emissions that were happening especially from fossil fuels industry but others were happening relatively high compared to this but of somewhere around 1940s or 1950s it just increased relatively high and much of this increase uh, in the 20th century is attributed you know or the carbon dioxide increase is attributed to industrial revolution because you know with the industrial expansion coming up you know we started using fossil fossil fuels as a source for in our energy demands so that's where industrial revolution contributed to this relatively higher increase in carbon dioxide and simultaneously we have land use change in forest lulcf which is the short form for it so land use change is basically you know changing the land from its original form like if you have a forest you cut it down you grow the culture or you have some other thing you have it for human habitations you have parks or anything that you, that you know basically modified the original land landscape land landscape or land use to other form that also releases carbon dioxide because you know what all is stored in the place is just coming out and then other non co2 emissions so other non co2 emissions are basically you know the is the processes that generally happens uh it can include you know volcanic activity or decomposition and so on and then there are some non co2 gases also that contribute to greenhouse greenhouse effect so what has happened is uh, in greenhouse gases sorry for that so if you look there so what we're seeing is uh with, with the increase in these gases emissions there is also accumulation of much of these uh greenhouse gases in the atmosphere okay and the concentration has also increased so what it has what has it led to so it it led to an increase in global surface temperatures you know uh compared to 1850 or the late 19th century now like almost 150 years ago we have you know on an average global surface temperature has increased by 1 degree 1.1 degrees which is very huge if you look at it at global scale uh see but, but you know there are it's not you know it's straight it's not a straight line so there are seasonal fluctuation that happens and there are annual fluctuation that happens so it there might be years that you know that are relatively cold that are relatively higher so to basically since we have most of our documentations you know properly from 1850s so to 1900s so that is what is considered as relative baseline and then where our emissions are also low so this is where our original baseline is being considered when you, which which you will talk about later and 
so what this temperatures are increasing this carbon dioxide are increasing so what so what it's natural because you know in human history so if you look at geological past of in earth we have you know documented cases of where the earth surface temperatures have been higher multiple times so 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 it may be just such case that you know uh, it might be just one of those cases where the temperature is increasing it will come down so but the thing is we are we as humans are responsible for this you know this increase in temperatures which you know uh, see if you, if you see from this plot here where human activity or human drivers are leading to you know very much increase in carbon dioxide or basically greenhouse gases and thus increasing the global surface temperature which is you know which is a real concern thing so so yeah we are responsible for this increase in or the climate change that we are seeing so that's what that that is that that, that is the first thing that you know that we have to identify because lot there are a lot of people uh, who are who people who say that climate change is real versus people who deny it or people lot of those people are called as you know climate change denial so it's, it's indeed uh, you know important to understand that this change is happening and then this change is happening because of us and so what there are it's happening so what is increasing global temperature of average temperature is increasing so uh, it's not like that situation so everyone everyone's daily life will be affected if, if if you know the climate change is happening so some of these examples that if you see here uh there there can be you can categorize them in in type of you know different type of effects like for instance uh food water and food production which will be really affected so if you look at here the just a brown circles rep represent you will be you know adverse impacts while green bars represent there are adverse impacts and positive impact that happens but the gray circles describe you know climate change driven observe you know there are observed but there is no global level assessment being done yet and the more number of dots below it is the the greater number of amount of confidence saying that ki this thing is going to happen because of the climate change so if you look here uh, most of our you know food security eat food and you know water security is going to be affected major you know uh, and there will be little positive a positive impact but most of it is negative and it's not it's not that thing uh, our health and well being is also going to be affected like you know just take the case of covid you know if you talk about you know non human origins it has been uh, because which that's where this is present in bats or take the case of you know recent nipa outbreak in kerala which is currently out, ongoing so this is happening because of climate change not only because of climate change because of land use change and how things are happening and not only physical health they also affect our mental health because and there is a displacement of humans because if because of climate change because uh, there will be increase in sea levels that is predicted because of increasing sea level the coastal cities town sort of cities where people are there they have to they have to they are displaced from those areas and there is increase in floods or storms and damage to infrastructure uh, so this is what is what has happened in the past two months especially in the states of uttarakhand and himachal where you know this uh, increasing number of western disturbances coupled with monsoon it has wreaked wreaked havoc you know in both these hill states of india and then it has caused huge amount of damage to both infrastructure and human life so it's 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 not far away that you know you see these adverse impacts which you have, we already started seeing many of those adverse impacts recently and there is also effect on biodiversity ecosystems so 
the effects will you know in, include changes in ecosystem structure the way the ecosystems are and not only in structure but also in species and the way how things work out uh, or the way they, these systems functions they are going to be affected so the, the, the effects are huge and some of them are not at quantified so doesn't mean that those effects are not there we just have to be very careful with how these effects are going to be and then some of these you know uh, are driven by you know physical climatic conditions like which are increasingly attributed to humans because it, it says if humans are responsible for this so if you attribute you know based on likeliness of things happening so things like you know increase in agriculture and ecological drought agriculture uh, drought or ecological drought happening has increased increasing fire weather uh, if you have been following up news recently uh, especially greece had a lot of fires recently australia had fires and then uh, even brazil brazilian ecosystems had fires so it's not like these areas are not having fires yet they were having fires but the scale at which the fires are having are coming up these days and the frequency has increased a lot and there's increasing flooding and then very likely things are the things that are going to happen are racial certain that are about sure to happen are like ocean acidification because you know ocean acidification is the ph gets lower because carbon dioxide is taken into water and then that forms carbonic acid in that in that way you know it reduces the ph the leading acidification increase in hot extreme heat weather like if you have been following similarly the news the hot extreme events has also increased. so it's not like we are not seeing the effects we are seeing the effects currently and yeah and so there are multiple scenarios uh where you know scientists have come up together and put up so that's what ipcc is is interpan interpanel government is intergovernmental panel you know uh so where there are four scenarios that they have brought up so the current warming level which is you know already 1.1 degrees warmer than the baseline which which we talked about earlier which is 1850s to 1900 if if the climate warms to 1.5 degrees celsius above that baseline level to 2 degrees 3 degrees and 4 degrees celsius so what are the effects that are going to happen so if you look at these events so let's just look at you know hottest day temperature and wettest day precipitation change so if you look as the temperature increases from the baseline it is going to you know the hottest day temperature is going to increase very much similarly annual wettest day precipitation is also going to increase very much across the globe so so uh yeah and then considering with urbanization the heat waves or the temperature change is going to be very extreme so yeah someone raised their hand so austin do you have anything to ask okay so so there are you know uh multiple scenarios that have been kept forward so what currently we are striving to do is try to limit it to the lower level so it's like we try to limit it to just 1.5 degrees warming rather than allowing it to reach 4 degrees warming <clears throat> so same the same thing so let's just look at the indian subcontinent which is you know south asia and then the nearby areas so if you look what is going to happen so if it's colored 
it's going to say it is increasing what all event we are check for we are having a look at it's going to increase and the confidence with which it's going to increase and if it's bar plot if it there are bars here it's you know it says uh it's it's in very low agreement so if you look at hot events like heat waves or the number of days in a year that are going to be you know very hot the base temperatures are going to be extreme it's going to increase so we so we should you know buckle up for increase number of heat waves and the hot temperature is going to rise much more that's what these models predict and if you look at agriculture and ecological drought uh, it's very unlikely that at least uh, there is very little agreement that these agriculture and ecological droughts are going to increase in the future and similarly heavy precipitation is said to increase in the future but it's with you know relatively lower confidence it's going to increase and yeah so the same thing so uh so what are how if if you want to see how is this going to affect uh things so here we are just say, i just said uh, we are trying to you know limit our uh increasing temperature till 1.5 degrees rather than allowing it to you know reach 4 so how how does it going to change so if you look at the emissions uh for us if we have to limit our emissions to 1.5 degrees or basically the temperatures to 1.5 degrees uh we have to you know reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide if, if you follow this path if you have to limit our carbon emissions has to go down following this blue line greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide emissions and if you have to if you want to achieve this limit or of 2 degrees celsius like we will not allow you know to for it to increase to 2 degrees celsius in the next couple of years we have to if if you follow this path of you know the amount of carbon dioxide emissions then we can achieve that to 2 degrees so if you look at these two graphs what these are pointing out is basically you know there has to be a reduction in the carbon dioxide emissions immediately then only we will be able to, able to achieve the target of reaching 1.5 degrees celsius limit if you see here also carbon dioxide emissions has to start reducing okay that's the blue and green line so whether it's going to happen or not that that's as far as to ask what measures are we taking to you know to follow which of these protocols our aim is to you know reduce it to 1.5 degrees but if we don't follow any protocols with the current implementation current policies we have in place this is the path we are going to choose <clears throat> you know so that's not going to help with the current policies most likely we might you know stay stable we might not increase much but we are not going to decrease either so that's not going to reduce the warming level so that's going to you know increase the warming level. so for for both greenhouse gases and car- carbon dioxide and and yeah so here there is another interesting thing if you refer to these plots uh, there is this thing called net zero net zero co2 and net zero ghg so net zero co2 here refers to you know there is no more new production of co2 that is happening so that's what so whatever is there in in the in in circulation that is what is being used to do this for to to check this so there is no new co2 being added to the atmosphere so if you just look at here 2019 emissions were 12% higher than what was there in 2010 so it doesn't look like you know we are actually uh going will be going down these two paths anytime soon with the, at least the policies in place 
uh, so yeah similarly if we have to achieve this 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees celsius uh, goals to limit the global climate warming to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees we have to start reducing you know carbon dioxide our greenhouse gases levels and then if we can achieve it by 2050 the carbon dioxide net zero where we stop producing you know new releasing new carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by 2050 we can reach you know our 1.5 degrees agreement as planned or with a little bit of overshoot to 1.6 or somewhere around that but if we fail to achieve it by 2050 and if we can achieve it by at least 2070 then we can keep the limit of the warming to two degrees Celsius. so so it depends on when how fast can we achieve this target of becoming a net zero for greenhouse gases is what is going to determine when what to what limit are we are going to warm our planet so there are multiple opportunities they suggest you know this report suggests where we can this can be scaled up so if you look about just the energy supply where where this energy supply is coming happening uh if you remember from previous lectures so if we, if we start using you know most of renewable energy we can reduce considerable amount of emissions so potential contribution to net emissions so and similarly uh, we have to you know do a lot of other things and but having renewable sources of energies like solar and wind can contribute you know greatly to to be one of the mitigation options to reduce that or to achieve this goal better similarly if you look at uh, you know some of these systems uh, red, if you reduce the conversion of natural ecosystems this land use change or basically deforestation and land use agriculture conversion is one of the major thing so if you if you reduce that conversion of natural ecosystems and let the ecosystems the way they are there is a high chance you know you can take the help of these ecosystems to mitigate those or yeah to mitigate those actions and if you have reforestation happening that that is going to help greatly also so there, there are multiple ways we can achieve this so basically we had to it's not like there is a single possible solution there are multiple possible solutions that can together come up you know to help us mitigate this uh climate action so so what 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 is our current prediction so if we fail you know uh so 2030 if you look here so this is the year 2023 because this it, it just marks the year when this report is published so we are here currently so we, we were you know we were supposed to go this path the dotted line which we have missed earlier and this represents you know one event that disrupts development for instance uh like the COVID pandemic that happened. So whenever such disruption happens, there will be, you know, there is a you know fluctuation that happened across and then you can go either path, either, you know, you can degrade in your path, the development for resilience of the, for the climate change, you can either degrade or you can bounce back pretty much. And then, you know, you can have much more better strategies. So if, if you go, if you have much more higher time of resilient development, you need to go these ways. So where you know you have low emissions, system transition that are happening, you have achieved sustainable developmental goals, low climate risk as well. But if you are not, if you fail to go down these paths and then we end up on these paths, you know, we'll we'll be you know we will no longer be climate resilient. So yeah. So that's how sustainable that they, they also point out how sustainable developmental goals being achieved will also contribute to uh, achieving the goals towards reducing the warming warming limit below 1.5 degrees. 
so for instance uh, this is you know uh, how adaptation versus mitigation strategies of this 17 sustainable developmental goals that were discussed earlier can be used so for instance uh, let's just have a look at one of these that we had discussed in detail earlier was the you know species on life on land so if you look at here uh, energy systems you can have a combination of both synergies and trade offs both mixed up for mitigation for 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 instance, for you to you know mitigate some of those things you either need to have trade offs associated with that or both some of those goals coming up together and then be able to achieve it together so yeah in that sense sustainable development goals are going to help us you know achieve these targets but they are not just enough so yeah what this said was you know this when this report came out on 20 march they said that you know there is urgent climate action needed now so that we can secure a livable future for all and there are they also said that there are multiple feasible and effective options to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to human caused climate change so there are options and they are available now and then we have to start acting now this is you know this is what this panel on climate change has released so it's not like we have gone way far if you have a look here so we are still here and then there there is still possibility for us you know to reach the, our uh, our goals of you know of limiting the warming below 1.5 degrees so it's not everything is not lost it's still there we can still achieve it okay uh so that's what the re recent press release has said and yeah so one of the important question that comes up is we all know that you know much of this is happening because of you know greenhouse gases especially the carbon dioxide right this climate warming is because these gases capture much of this infrared radiation uh from the from the you know from the sun and then traps it as heat energy and then that leads to warming right so this is a greenhouse effect so because of this effect uh the what we have got the gases which we have released already are going to stay for you know lot of time and then have this effect even for a lot of time like for instance if you just cut down you know all of the emissions let's say for instance in a hypothetical scenario we stopped emitting all of these greenhouse gases just today itself so all of this will fall to zero whether is that going to reduce the global temperatures from tomorrow itself no or a month itself no it will take certain years because the, the all these gases that are present in the atmosphere are there for a while longer and then they have this effect for longer durations so for us to if we can implement these you know now then only we can see these effects in the longer run so what are some of those things that we can implement you know to uh, reduce the carbon dioxide in the earth or, or the atmosphere so some of the options that people come up with direct air capture so you just capture the carbon dioxide directly from air and then we use it for storage or bio energy with carbon capture and storage so you capture carbon dioxide and then use that as source of energy so that you know uh, you are having energy and then you are using the carbon dioxide or you can have a forestation and reforestation programs which are basically uh planting lot of trees and then uh reforesting or uh, having new forest areas which basically trees you know are have harvest most of the carbon dioxide as they grow because they form the carbon form the structure element of any organism right and you can have biochar soil carbon 
and because basically this so so carbon also can be you know sequestered into the soil and you can have you know uh, reduce the weathering and then you can have ocean fertilization basically uh, the carbon dioxide can be you know put up into the ocean so that you know you can have that those ecosystems being sequestered in the carbon dioxide so there are multiple ways in which you know this carbon dioxide removal can happen but if you look at afforestation and reforestation is something we we strive to achieve but we are all we are still not able to achieve it for achieve it for a long even we we achieve it uh, after a certain point you know you will be out of line for we might be out of line for planting more trees so that's why there is this need for removing the carbon dioxide that is put up in the air. So how do we remove that? So that's what we call as carbon capture and storage. So carbon capture and storage or CCS in short term refers to technologies that capture this greenhouse gas, specifically, specifically carbon dioxide and store it safely underground so that you know it doesn't contribute to climate change so if the gas is not present in the atmosphere uh it's not going to you know absorb heat and so you know you're kind of having a solution for uh, you know you, you climate will not be that wrong so there are multiple ways this can be cap captured so it can be captured uh directly from the air itself so you can have you know set up a plant here let's say uh, in Delhi or Bangalore, and capture the start capturing carbon dioxide from there, and then you, you capture it and then you know you store it on the That's one way. The other way is point source capture, or you know from where the emissions of carbon dioxide happens the most. Like for instance, factory uh, cement cement manufacturing factories, or you know coal powered thermal power plants coal fire coal powered thermal power plants if you, if you install these carbon capture technologies there itself you are essentially trapping catch uh trapping the carbon dioxide just from the source itself so you're not giving it you know time to go into the atmosphere and then uh, allowing it to you know increase the warming then you are capturing again that that's not going to happen so you're just as the carbon dioxide is being emitted we're just capturing it from there itself from the source itself directly and then using it for storage or in some instances you can use it as you know you can use it for different purposes like for instance where all carbon dioxide can be used if you are fond of you know freeze drinks or uh, all soft drinks or hard drinks all 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 of them have you know carbon dioxide dissolved in those drinks so it's not a huge mark, so you can't use all the carbon dioxide and just start pumping them into the drink. They'll eventually come out. So that's one of those potential uses that you can have for carbon dioxide or some other places. It can be utilized too. So how does this happen? So this carbon capture and storage, have, you know, there are three major parts in it. So you capture carbon dioxide from industrial plants or from, you know, from, from the air directly to transport in liquid you liquefy the gas you transport it as in liquid state and then you inject it directly underground in a permit for permanent storage so let's look at one of one by one so as i was saying earlier the direct capture ha happens last largely at industrial facilities such as steel mills cement plants or petrochemical facilities or power plants or you can have from the atmosphere also and then how do we capture there are different technologies there is this thing called adsorption where the carbon dioxide gets attached on the surface of the molecule but when you change some certain conditions like you know ph or temperature or some other thing the carbon dioxide you know the molecule dissociates easily and then you can use this uh, material again to you know to recapture you can reuse the material again it's not like you're exhausting the material so that's that's that can be one way so you can have multiple ways to capture carbon dioxide specifically 
and they have been proven and then people are using them these days and then how once you have the carbon captured you know the carbon dioxide is compressed it's compressed so that you know compress once when a gas is compressed it so it you know it behaves like a liquid so the compressed carbon dioxide is you know is dehydrated and sent for transport so most of this transport happens on the line or over land by using pipes pipelines for large quantities for some regions you know this might not be possible so where you know container ships larger ships that has a capacity to you know carry liquid are used for transport from one place to another so once this transport has been done so what happens is you have to keep it for storage so where do we keep it for storage so mostly uh there are two different ways these are generally stored one is you know you just inject it deep underground into deep underground rock formations uh if you have uh, if you have watched the lecture where you know uh where this point was made that you know there are some certain rock formation that doesn't allow gas to escape so you either look out for those set of those type of rock formations which are found more than at depths of more than 1 km and where it can be safely and stored for you know permanent at least that's in theory uh, or you can also store them in oil and gas reserves so basic so you can start so because we have lot of oil and gas reserves or places where we have drilled up oil and gas and those reserves or those pockets have gone empty we can fill those pockets with this liquid carbon dioxide and since they have, these gases have been there for millions of years locked down there is a high chances that if you fill those areas with whatever the carbon dioxide that was sequestered uh ice going to stay for you know considerable amount of time in the future also as of now there are somewhere around 300 million tons of co2 has been injected underground in such things uh but the good thing is we have you know used a lot of fossil fuels we had dug up in a lot of areas we had drilled into and then we have emptied much of those places and then we have considerable amount of storage that can ha- harbor this carbon dioxide that we have you know generated in this past century or so so how does this happen so you can uh yeah where all we can inject you can inject it in saline formations where this carbon dioxide go reacts and just stays there or you can inject into deep unmineable coal seams where you know coal formations have happened and then you can just inject into them where you know there's no way possible for us to mine or you can use it in depleted oil and gas reserves you can pump them in there or the other interesting use you can use this for you know is enhanced oil recovery so basically uh, what they do is like if you have a reservoir that is there uh, of natural gas and oil if you start pumping those reservoir with with the carbon dioxide which is you know uh, shown in this yellow once you start pumping it inside you will you know will be because of the pre- increased pressure and less space the oil and gas that is already present there will have to come out so that's how you know you are not actually spending a lot of energy uh, you know picking, getting the oil out you are you know using carbon dioxide sequestering and sequestering it and then you are also recovering lot of oil you know in greater quantity so yeah so there are multiple ways you can store them uh it's already happening so carbon capture and storage is already happening around the world and there are uh according to global ccs institute uh, there are around 29 operating facilities that have cap capability to you know sequester at least 40 million tons per annum into the earth so the amount 
of carbon that these 29 facilities can provide per annum is basically taking 8 million cars off the road. So, equivalent. So, does it say that, you know, does it mean that, you know, we can, there is way we can put up, you know, a lot of carbon dioxide inside. So, we can, we can produce more. Mm, no, that's not how it works. So, if you have more production, it's not going to help either. So, we should strive for, you know, reduction in the production now and try to reduce whatever is there, we have to take it out. And uh, so this is one such uh, power power station from Canada that has you know carbon capture and sequestration installed at the power station itself at the point source itself. So what does this do? As the you know coal fire, uh, see it's a coal powered plant. So as the carbon dioxide or gases are com coming out of itself. It will separate the gases, take out the carbon dioxide, and then remove the carbon dioxide from the gas, and then they liquefy it, and then they use it, they transport it to you know storage places wherever it can be stored in a proper manner. So yeah, that is uh, carbon capture and storage. Yes, uh, that's all. Yeah, for carbon. Yeah, that's all for today's session. So this is such an interesting uh, thing that is happening recently. And if you are interested, you can you know you can go to YouTube and search. There are a lot of companies that are currently actually doing this in Europe, and there are nice videos uh, that are present for you know to show how this process actually happened. Uh, if you are if you are interested, you can just go and search for them also, so that you know you can learn more about this way of removing carbon dioxide from that but it has its own associated risk like uh, you know if some geological activity happens in that area where you have stored it just you know pumps all of the carbon dioxide in just a way but it's not like we are not doing this uninformed we are taking these informed decisions where you know there's chances of finding such areas where geological activity is less they only will try to you know have we assess these things first and then we'll start use that as a carbon storage once your pumper or the place is filled you just close off the wall permanently so that you know it can't come out uh so yeah that that's it so if you have any questions or clarifications um, i'll be happy to take them. Uh, anything regarding carbon capture or ITCC or climate change, the effects of climate change. So, nothing. So if we have nothing, then we'll stop here then. Yeah, that will be the session for today. Uh, thank you, thank you for joining. We'll stop here. Yeah, you can leave. Thank you.